Good afternoon or good morning, depending uh, what part of the country that you're in for uh, this particular webinar on Ask the Doctor. So uh, as this was advertised earlier, uh, there's a number of questions that uh, have come in from a variety of people over time. And uh, for people who are live, I'm going to encourage you to, uh, in the bottom corner of your your, your go to meeting, uh, whatever we want to call it, you can type in questions as we go along, or if there's uh, things you want further uh, indications uh, for, you know, in general. Uh, you know, we can uh, basically do that uh, aspect of things. Um, so, you know, the hope is to, uh, you know, we have a whole variety of different things around topics of all sorts. It's all, it's a helter skelter type thing. And that's really what uh, this is going to be about is just asking, uh, you know, questions about anything that you have in medicine that you may not have found uh, an answer to. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to give you a little bit of insight or a little bit of thought uh, about that. So once again, don't be uh, shy about uh, typing in uh, any additional questions or requiring uh, further information about any of the things that uh, that we're going to talk about. So the first one that came up, it says, uh, is there a natural cure for swimmer's ear? So swimmer's ear, of course, is a obviously it's it's interesting time of year. So I'm assuming the person who asked this question must live in like as one of the southern states like where I am in Arizona. Uh, it's, it's water and it's bacteria in the water that, you know, that gets in the ear. Bacteria uh, ultimately uh, can get in there per se. So yeah, they, they, uh, actually the natural treatment for swimmer's ear is, uh, is, is pretty simple. Uh, first of all, when you get out of the, when your child, that's usually a child that we're talking about, when they get out of the water, you have to dry the ear really well. Uh, even with a blow dryer, if, you know, the, depending where they are from, you know, what you have available to you. But uh, a mix of 50-50 of alcohol and um, peroxide and just, you know, in a little, a little bottle, a little tincture bottle that I'll talk about in a minute for another question. Uh, and you just put it in there and the alcohol evaporates rapidly and it will kill uh, any bacteria or anything that are left in the ear. Um, other things that can be helpful is uh, drops of mullein and garlic um, that you can basically put in the ear canal uh, afterwards. You know, the, the mix of alcohol and, and peroxide, which you just get in the drugstore, is, I mean, pretty simple. Um, you know, it's, it's a very simple solution and it, and it works really, uh, really well. And uh, it's more about drying the ear when you get out of the water, which with whether it's a towel, face cloth or hair dryer and then using the the mix which basically pretty rapidly evaporate you don't need very much just a little bit in the ear and then mullein and garlic drops uh in the ear also is, are the things that uh, i found to be highly successful without any uh, further need of uh, any other type of uh, situation uh, that's going on uh are colonoscopies really recommended for anybody over 50. um you know, colonoscopies, in fact, their, the recommendation has been to, to lower that recommendation to age 45 because unfortunately they are finding uh, more and more people who are um, being diagnosed with uh, colon cancer uh, at a younger age, unfortunately. Uh, so is this a good idea or is this not a good idea? So this comes down to uh, one's individual history. The, uh, if you have a family history, uh, a sibling, a parent, a grandparent, uh, some sort of in sort of the close family relation uh, of, of any type of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, such as uh, Crohn's disease or uh, all sort of colitis, or of course, if there's any history of uh, colon cancer or any history of polyposis where there's been lots of polyps, that type of thing. Uh, then it is recommended that it's a good idea to do a colonoscopy. Uh, if you do not have a history of that and you personally don't have any particular, you know, bowel issues that uh, that are distressing or problematic or uh, any of the, the typical type things of having free, either frequent diarrhea or bloody stools or a lot of distress in the digestive system, uh, there now is a DNA test uh, that you probably have seen advertised on television called Cologuard. 
Uh, Cologuard is, uh, re requires a doctor's prescription, so you'd have to ask your doctor uh, to do that. And they obviously would be the one who would know your history more in detail uh, and would be able to answer any questions from that. And they will write a script. Uh, I think they send it directly to the Cologuard manufacturers who send you the kit. You basically do a stool sample, you send it off, uh, result goes to your doctor, your doctor will then uh, pass on the results to you. And if, and the results have been uh, quite promising uh, doing it that way. Uh, obviously, what it does not require is it does not require the prep, which is the biggest issue that uh, many people are mostly concerned about is this the distress that comes with having to drink, you know, this gallon of, of liquid. And once again, that also has been changing uh, the last while. And uh, depending on your specific situation, depending on what your digestive system has been working at, uh, there are different things that are possible. And I would say in general, the uh, distress uh, that comes, uh, that we hear about, that you may have already experienced or may know somebody who didn't have such a, a, a you know, a good uh, aspect of that. Uh, you know, uh, discouraging. Uh, the other is another potential problem that some people have heard about uh, or get uh, um, <clears throat> uh, is the aspect of, uh, you know, what happens with the, the sedation. And some people can have an unfortunate negative reaction to the type of sedation uh, that, that's used and may feel a little bit off uh, for some period of time. Um, you know, if there's a history of that type of thing, there's other things that can be done for that. You can you support how the body ultimately needs to clear out uh, those medications or any medications. And of course, my number one go-to in those scenarios is always to do a castor oil pack uh, over your entire abdomen, especially your liver, which is on the right side, because it's the liver's job and the liver needs to process any medication, uh, including the medication that's given for the sedation uh, while the gastroenterologist does the, does, the, does the treatment. So it's not as bad as some people think. I am a fan of uh, colonoscopies in, in the indications that I've said, or if there's not those indications, then uh, getting a uh, Cologuard, <clears throat> which once again, you've seen advertised uh, on television, uh, is, is indeed a, a reasonable option. So then people say, well, how often should I get it? I get it done. And so typically if you do a colonoscopy and it's totally clear, they generally say, oh, you should have it done in 10 years from now. So if you have a second one done and it's clear, then you never need to do it again. Uh, because the, you know, we have, there's a historically, a colon cancer is the type of thing that takes anywhere from 15 to 20 to some cases 30 years to even manifest. And, if it's been clear for, you know, two colonoscopies, um, I say you're done. Uh, no matter what your age is, you wouldn't need to worry about it. And last, once again, there's this family history stuff uh, or somebody uh, develops uh, a specific problem there. If you had have, if you have had a polyp done or, and they've done a, uh, they removed it and then, you know, they may suggest you redo it in five years. And if it's clean, I always feel if you've had two clean colonoscopies, you're done. Uh, there's, there's really not much benefit uh, to keep doing it because the length of time it would take for something to develop to manifest into a problem uh, is not going to happen. I stopped taking multivitamins a long time ago and I've not noticed anything different. As one gracefully ages is a balanced diet, a good amount of exercise and rest sufficient, or do we have to take multivitamins? Well, that's a great question because that's a great question because we see this advertised all the time and we hear one side of the medical field saying multivitamins are a waste of time and we have another side says oh you everybody's over something like 80 percent of the um, and, and united states population is deficient on, on evaluation of at least one mineral mineral more so than vitamins because vitamins relatively speaking are easier to absorb than minerals are which are typically harder to absorb just because of the mechanism that's required for that to happen personally i am not a fan of multivitamins at any time uh maybe pregnancy i shouldn't say that pregnancy definitely has a specific need uh there are specific 
uh, some specific health uh, situations that uh, multivitamins, we'll say multivitamins, multiminerals are of some benefit. I'm much more of a fan, however, of, of um, supporting minerals than I am vitamins in general. So um, the reason that you typically, uh, the only, in my opinion, the only people who will feel anything from taking a multivitamin is somebody who has a less than stellar diet uh, that already is grossly in, insufficient in a combination of vitamins and minerals. Um, and so if their, their diet is what we call the standard American diet, which unfortunately includes a lot of processed type foods and not enough whole foods, uh, those people probably could take a multivitamin on a regular basis and say, oh, it definitely helps my energy or my digestion feels a little bit better or you know, maybe I sleep a little bit better. But the average person who is including um, you know, a whole variety. And my recommendation is the goal that we should strive for because the research from a couple of years ago showed that uh, 10 different colors of fruits and vegetables uh, dramatically reduces the incidence of cancer, uh, dramatically reduces the incidence of heart disease, uh, autoimmune disease, et cetera. So, you know, it used to be the, you know, eat the rainbow or eat five different colors. Well, the research now is 10. So, and, it, and you know, and there's, we can say there's seven colors of the rainbow, but if we look at the Crayola uh, crayon box, we know there's a lot more than, than the seven colors of the rainbow or the seven colors of the chakras <clears throat> in general. Uh, so the, the greater the variety of foods that you eat, especially with lots of different colors, absolutely the less the need that a multivitamin is going to do much or you're going to notice much. So yes, you do need a move. Uh, and my rule of thumb uh, with that is, um, and I'll sort of give you my my take on that for, for, for what's going on, um, is, you know, first of all, the best exercise still is and always will be is walking. Without any doubt. Um, a year ago, uh, I attended a seminar in Spokane, and I'm about to attend a similar seminar. It's in Mexico uh, in a month from now. Uh, that really is about movement, eating, and fitness. And one of the other speakers who spoke uh, spoke of the fact of you know what you know what ends up happening uh, for people uh, over time as far as <clears throat> their, um, you know, their, their ability to move and concern. So people go to the gym, they want to do treadmills, they want to do weights and all that kind of thing. So this is my rule of thumb. Whatever activity you choose to do, when you finish the activity, you have to be able to do the same activity again within 10 minutes. So if you do this, whatever activity, if you want to play squash or if you want to play tennis or if you want to pound weights or if you want to run 15 miles or... You know, if you want to do 100 squats or 55 push-ups, you know, whatever it is you choose to do, because that's where you're at as far as what you think you need to do from a cardiovascular perspective, which is important, of course. Uh, when you stop 10 minutes later, if you cannot repeat it, you have now exceeded your body's physiologic limits. And that's not a good thing, because that will absolutely uh, hasten aging uh, in people. And unfortunately, uh, because we happen to see professional athletes in our clinic uh, who are being paid millions of dollars in many cases, they are exceeding their physiologic limits and they age much more rapidly than somebody else. Now we can say, well, they can afford to age because, you know, at 35, they, their careers may be done, <clears throat> but they still have a lot of years to live, but they're physiologically not 35. They're physiologically 55 or 60. So, you know, depending on one's age and what it is you do. So if you cannot repeat whatever activity you just did uh, in 10 minutes, then you have to decrease that activity until you can repeat it in 10 minutes. And then when you build up your stamina and your ability to repeat it, good, increase it. So, you know, we, we want to start here. Your goal is to get here, uh, but we don't have to get here tomorrow. If we can only get to here tomorrow, great. And it takes a month to move to here, great. Eventually, we'll get there. So the other question to ask is, what do you want to be able to do when you're 65, 75, 
80 years old. Uh, do you want to be able, if you're lifting 100 pounds, do you want to be able to lift 100? Is it necessary to you be able to lift 100 pounds when you're 75 years old? Or would you rather just be able to walk around the block? Would you Would you like to be able to put your socks on? Would you like to be able to sit on the toilet? Uh, would you like to be, and with that, would you like to be able to get out of bed uh, without help? If those are what your goals are, those are the types of activities that you should put into your everyday life. Those are the types of activities that we should look at when we're talking about movement. And I prefer to use the word movement than exercise because movement includes yoga, tai chi, qigong, walking, stretching, all those types of things. And doing some type of resistance, which will increase muscle strength, is also a good idea. So that's my take on <clears throat> a sort of exercise in, in general. <clears throat> so uh, hopefully that's a long-winded answer to your multivitamins. Are they necessary? And not if you're doing all the things we've just talked about. If you are has a have a standard American diet that is less than desirable, yeah, you'll probably benefit from doing that. But to take a multivitamin, thinking that it's a substitute or just in case I'm not meeting it, that's not a good reason to be taking a multivitamin. As a, as a doctor, of course, uh, we do individual testing on people and you can do things like SpectraCell where you actually can measure people's nutritional status. And they may need specific nutrients. Rarely do they say take a multivitamin and it solves all. You may need uh, B vitamins, or maybe you'll need lipoic acid, or maybe you'll need coenzyme Q10, or you know some type of uh, zinc or extra antioxidants, depending on what your specific status is. So in those cases, we recommend that is what gets uh, supplemented. And so that would be a function of uh, working with uh, your individual practitioner to uh, try and able to, to, to determine that. Uh, how do you test for heavy metals and what is the best way to eliminate them from the body? Um, um, I've had, you know, I've, I've done, of course, I've been in medicine for a very long time. So I've, I've, they say I've gone around the block with uh, lots of things. And so the standard way that, that, or the common way, if you've been to a practitioner, a, a, a naturopath, or, uh, you know, an alternative the therapist who uh, does, you know, some type of um, heavy metal testing, you know, one of the oldest ones that has been around uh, forever is just a hair analysis. It's inexpensive. It does give you, it can put you in the ballpark uh, about things doesn't tell you what your body burden is, but unfortunately no test uh, tells you what your body burden is. So uh, the simplest way that I do it be to, I'll say do a screening test uh, is because people will come in and you know maybe they've had amalgams in their teeth or maybe they've been at an occupation where they've been exposed to a whole variety of different chemicals that are heavy metals and they wonder about, you know, is it cadmium, is it arsenic, is it lead, is it mercury, which is uh, obviously from the amalgams of people's teeth, or is it some other uh, type of heavy metal? Once again, a hair analysis can put us in. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, uh, I was at a seminar where uh, a physician, uh, one of the professors at uh, one of the naturopathic colleges in, in uh, Seattle, I gave a very almost a whole day a seminar on heavy metals. and without getting into the all the biochemistry of things over his 30 years of, of really focusing on this type of a topic. Now, what he found is he says a great screening, and we're going to make the assumption that kidney function is working fine, because if it's not, that's a whole other ballgame. Uh, but assuming one's kidney function is, is adequate and, you know, standard blood tests will tell us that, um, you can do, you can measure serum lead. People say, well, I don't know if I've been exposed to lead. Well, we have. I mean, if, if you're old enough to be around when lead and gasoline was still an issue and lead is still, you know, in a variety of different types of things, it's in, depending on the pipes in your house, if they were soldered and they're metal and et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, lead has been an exposure. But anyway, if when you do a serum lead, uh, the number should be less than one milligram per deciliter or whatever the units are uh, that ultimately they use. So I do that as a screening tool, and if I do a heavy uh, hair analysis and that doesn't look too, too suspect, I usually say to people, your problem I, is unlikely to be problematic with uh, heavy metals. However, if it is more than one, now we have a suspicion uh, that, we, um, <clears throat> that there, we're going to uh, be 
probably trying to figure out how to how do we get this out of the body. Uh, and when I say hair analysis, uh, one of my students uh, from 15 years ago when I was still in Portland and teaching, I uh, did, a, did a thesis working with uh, Doctors Data, which is a company out of Chicago uh, that do a lot of the hair analysis. And he created a grid and how the essential elements in our body and the heavy metals sort of interact. And he created a grid and there's a sort of a scoring sheet. And when, so when I get the hair analysis back, I use the grid. And if the number comes back greater than 10, and if I have a serum lead level greater than one on just a regular blood test, then on my suspicion of heavy metals goes up considerably. If the numbers are very low and the serum lead is low, uh, according to the lecture from a couple of years ago, this probably is not, pursuing that is probably not gonna change much as far as uh, you know uh, what a patient is experiencing as far as uh, their heavy metal load is, uh, is concerned. So there's, you know, the standard way of removing heavy metals is being chelation therapy, which can both be done through IV therapy, which obviously you'd have to go to a practitioner or a therapist who does IV therapy, or there's also oral therapy using a DMPS, uh, which is an agent that acts as a chelating agent, which grabs onto things and allows the body to eliminate it, uh, which, is, which is what I used to do, uh, but now, uh, I don't do um, those, I won't say I never do those, but less commonly. Uh, now we actually have drainage formulas that are homeopathic remedies, uh, specifically designed to work within physiologic limits uh, that gradually over time will lower the person's uh, load uh, on their system. Uh, because one of the greatest challenges when you do an act of uh, heavy metal chelation therapy is unfortunately you're not only removing heavy metals, you remove all metals and minerals. Uh, so then, you know, afterwards you have to go back and you have to get a Myers to put the metal, the good metals back in because maybe you've removed too many minerals that you need to, to adequately function. So there's this give and take things that are going on. So I much prefer this whole idea of drainage that we don't, I know we're not exceeding physiologic limits and we're not getting into the problem of having to worry about, well, did we take too much zinc out or did we take too much magnesium out or what's your calcium level doing now or, you know, any of the other metals that are essential in the body for uh, all our uh, tens of thousands of, of uh, interactions that are happening, uh, you know, every, every split second in our body. So hair analysis on the grid with the serum lead, that's my screening. If it's fine, uh, then I don't worry about it. And the thing is, if you do a, a heavy metal test with some form of a provocative agent like DMPS, uh, it doesn't tell you once again what the burden is, just tells you whether or not you can eliminate it. But, you know, sometimes people will do, you know, six months of chelation, redo the test and the numbers are higher. It says, well, it just means you got more to take out. So there's no real scale that, in my opinion, that gives you an adequate thing and says, we start off at 100 and we want it down to two. It will gradually always get less and less. The 100 doesn't mean anything. It just means, uh, you know, if you do it on a test, it means your body has the ability to eliminate it. And if you do the test and it doesn't high, on the other hand, it doesn't mean that necessarily you don't have it. Maybe your body can't eliminate it per se, but the chelating agents and the provocative agents are an attempt to get past that. So there's a lot of information out there about that type of thing. So once again, that has to be looked at individually by yourself and the practitioner uh, to determine whether the assumption may be whatever your challenges are that you're presenting to the doctor with, uh, are something that are worthy of, of uh, uh, being managed uh, over time. Okay, I hope that answers that question. Uh, this next question is, uh, I'm a 70 year old and suffered damage to my medulla two years ago. Uh, I live with uh, Wallenberg's syndrome. Uh, uh, how may I aid new growth of nerve tissue and develop uh, new neural pathways? Uh, I'm told I can't by my Western doctors, I don't believe them. So uh, I would need more information. So first of all, uh, the medulla is in the back of the brain and uh, <clears throat> Wallenberg syndrome is usually the result of a stroke uh, that happened in that specific, specific area of the brain. And because the brain is important for a number of functions, depending on this particular individual, it can affect swallowing, it can affect spe uh, speaking, <clears throat> and it can have a variety of other uh, types of uh, presentations. And of course, if the, so the question is, can you get new neural pathways? 
So the real question is, is what at the time of the stroke, how soon was intervention done? Because we know the sooner an intervention is done in a stroke, the less likely the damage. The challenge when, when a person does have a stroke uh, is that the, there's a specific area where, and a stroke of course is a compromised blood flow. And no matter what we do, if, we're, if we can improve uh, you know, the symptoms by regenerating new brain cells and, and the new neural pathways, it's totally 100% incumbent is, is there blood flow. If there's no blood flow, you can't do much of anything because you can't get nutrients in and you can't get waste products out. So we're gonna make the assumption that there is a blood flow <clears throat> and we can in fact enhance we can in fact enhance the blood flow. And if we can do that, we, we obviously have to, first of all, check what's the circulation? What's the circulation coming into somebody's head? Uh, here in the office, we do that with a contact regulation thermography, which can give us a good indication of how does your body respond to stress? Is blood flow into your head or is blood flow out of your head? And very often uh, the neck can have a huge impact on that and the medulla being an area back there, there may be a compromise. It would not surprise me if the, the, this uh, person who asked the question is lymphatic system is quite congested because we see that very often. Sometimes the sinuses unbeknownst to them is congested. So we're, we have some degree of impediment of blood flow up into the head area. And it's not because they're carotid arteries, which are here are you know mostly blocked in this poor circulation. Uh, we're talking something else. So we're gonna make the assumption the lymphatic is decent and maybe we need to do lymph massage or lymph stars or <clears throat> something like that to enhance that on a regular basis. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, cardiovascular wise things are have decent, uh, which goes, you know, the checking all that uh, particular aspect out. Then you say, well, what about nutrition? Well, we know the brain is, is mostly made up of fat and specifically the, the type of fat is called DHA. And which is one of the supplements I recommend for young babies because babies, as babies are developing their brain, they need a lot of DHA more so than EPA, which is more for joints and muscles and cardiovascular and that type of thing. The brain needs, uh, therefore, uh, DHA, <clears throat> so which is a type of essential fatty acid, which you can you can get it in combination with EPA or get it on its own. You also need to make sure that the circulation is fine. And so there's things like uh, antioxidants, there's things like bioflavonoids uh, that will enhance that. There's, there's, there's different agents, there's different herbal things that will enhance circulation up into the head. Uh, using uh, and practicing on whatever the, the individual symptoms are that uh, this patient may have can certainly do that. Uh, neurofeedback uh, may be also a, another um, way to basically enhance that. And that type of thing. And these are not something that are going to happen, you know, take this for a month and you're better. These are some of these is the long term process of healing. We know, unfortunately, that the nervous system is probably the, the area of the body that heals the slowest and takes the longest uh, to heal. Uh, but doesn't mean you sh we shouldn't try. Uh, we do know that uh, many years ago, 20 years ago, probably when I was once again still in Portland, uh, there was a study done on centurions who had Alzheimer's at the hospital in, in Portland. <clears throat> and by doing different types of therapies, they actually showed that you could enhance, um, you know, neurons uh, in the brain of people who are 100 years old. But once again, it's totally dependent on do you have good circulation going up into that area? And it, the same is true of any body part. If you don't have good circulation, no matter what you do, it, the body can't heal it. The body needs blood, needs oxygen, needs nutrition in, and it needs waste products out. And you have to have, that's a two-way street. And without having that two-way street, <clears throat> nothing uh, ultimately could get better. Uh, let's see. A friend uh, recently turned 30 and came down with her first case of chicken pox. Her town totally freaked out. Uh, she was even visited by a public health official and there was talk of a quarantine. Her husband is now rethinking vaccinating their children. Uh, do you have any advice, uh, talking points that could ease her mind? <clears throat> well, chicken pox, as we know, is a viral condition. Uh, it's the, uh, the early, you know, usually kids get this in childhood because kids were supposed to get sick, which is a misnomer that kids shouldn't be getting sick. In fact, uh, children under two and three should have like four colds a year. That's totally normal. Um, why? Because 
their immune system being immature needs the exposure to things outside of us, not us, foreign to us, called microbes, whether they be bacterial, whether they be viral, <clears throat> you know, et cetera. So the whole, this whole concept of vaccines uh, came about with the idea that, uh, well, you know, we want to somehow minimize uh, the potential exposure because we don't have any medications to be able to treat these things that people are just miserable. And some people who have other types of serious problems unfortunately may may pass away as we hear about with the flu shot <clears throat> you know there's uh, on average 36,000 people in the United States who will pass away over the next few months uh, but when you do a statistical analysis of that you'll find that there mo many of them are already uh, have a number of other concerns the children who pass away usually have other concerns it's not impossible but it's less common uh, that a so-called healthy child who gets the flu is going to die of you know whatever flu strain we happen to have uh, over the next few months during the winter time so people who are compromised uh, are more susceptible to this type of thing so you know we could say so i would need to know what the issue is with this 30 year old uh, why suddenly she obviously was exposed her own kids or she went somewhere into daycare or some kid had that and her own immune system Apparently, at least she has no memory of it, had never been exposed to that virus, so she got chickenpox, uh, which once again is a viral type condition. And, you know, as a practitioner, I have lots of tools, I have lots of things in my toolbox uh, that can allow people to treat viruses, things simply as vitamin C, uh, vitamin A as another thing. Uh, monolaurin, which is a, a made up of lauric acid, uh, which is basically from coconut. Uh, we hear about a whole variety of different, there's a many, there's a combination of many herbal uh, type remedies that can treat viral things. And, you know, chicken soup, rest, uh, turn off your cell phone, go to bed, do warming socks, do a casserole pack, do an Epsom salt bath. These are all types of, of uh, types of things we can then, for the lesions themselves, we can do things like essential oils uh, to support, <clears throat> you know, the healing of the lesion. Uh, yes, somebody with any virus potentially uh, can reinfect somebody coughing or coughing onto things and uh, reusing, you know, uh, you know, uh, utensils and that type of thing. So common uh, hygiene practices, uh, you know, can be that. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Public health gets involved because I guess they're afraid that you know the whole community is going to be infected with with chickenpox, which is their job, and I appreciate the, their level of responsibility. But as far as the individual is concerned, uh, you know, she would have to step back and say, okay, so why did I get this? So is she not sleeping well enough? Is, is she, you know, burning the candle at both ends? Is, you know, what's her diet been like? Is she more stressed at work? You know, the, all those types of factors, because all those types of factors have to come into play also, because viruses that we're all we're exposed to every day are opportunistic. Uh, you know, if, if, if any of you who've ever had a cold sore, on their mouth, it just means you, at some point, were exposed to the herpes virus way back when. Usually it happens in childhood. And then, you know, why is the virus is always there. It's like, well, why do we not have a chronic cold sore? Uh, well, we don't have it because our immune system keeps it under check. But if we're more stressed or don't sleep or we're out in the sun for too long or, you know, there's suddenly something dramatic happens and traumatic in our life and we get weakened, then the virus is more of an opportunity to come to the surface and will basically come out. So, you know, it's, it's a balancing act that we constantly are having to be mindful of uh, when dealing with these types of things. So hopefully, uh, once again, the aspect of, you know, uh, what advice? Well, hopefully you can give us that type of advice. And, you know, a 30 year old, I mean, we, once again, everybody should be getting sick at least once or twice a year. Children four or five times, uh, adults once or twice. If you don't, it means you never tune up your immune system. And it would be like driving your car and never never changing the spark plugs, never tuning it up, never changing your oil and wondering why after a period of time the car isn't running very, is not very gas efficient anymore. We need constant exposure of our systems to, to keep it in check. And so when, when a patient says, oh, I haven't been sick in years, I usually say, you know, that's not a good thing uh, because your immune system is getting lazier and lazier. 
that's when we start to see, unfortunately, sometimes catastrophic uh, diagnosis of different types of problems, <clears throat> per se. All right, moving on. Uh, any thoughts on what could be causing or how to fix dry eye? Uh, dry eye is a number of things. Uh, conjunctivitis sicka uh, is just dry eye. <laughs> Autoimmune disease is one of the things that cause that. Blocked uh, tear ducts uh, can cause that. Uh, Sjogren's, which is an autoimmune uh, type problem that uh, is well renowned for causing dry eyes. Um, so what do we do about it? Uh, you know, uh, we, we see restasis being advertised. We see artificial tears being advertised uh, as something for dry eye. Uh, I have a simpler solution that has been helpful for some people, in fact, many people, is a in, at nighttime is a drop of castor oil in the very corner of the eye. Um, obviously, it creates a film. It's an oil, but castor oil on the body it improves. It significantly improves lymphatic system. And I've had good success with people, you know, with, assuming once again uh, that they've uh, ruled out the idea of Sjogren's or some other autoimmune type problem. If somebody's had a transplant of some type, graft versus host is another possibility that uh, create uh, that type of dry eye. Menopause is a dry eye is not uncommon in menopause, just like the vaginal tissues get a lot drier, so does the mucous membranes get a lot drier, the inside of their nose can be dry, their mouth can be dry, et cetera. So there, there is a variety of those types of conditions uh, that do that, <clears throat> cause that. Uh, and so short of, uh, you know, eye drops uh, per se, which you can get at the pharmacy, uh, castor oil is very inexpensive and quite effective uh, for lots of people uh, to do that. Uh, will it fix it? Uh, we'll certainly improve it, and I definitely have had people who are on, sort of on the verge of, of even getting plugs put in, so the, the tears that they make uh, don't sort of run away that normally do, because you are constantly uh, bathing our eye in, in uh, you know, in tears to basically flush things out that uh, we get exposed to uh, on an everyday basis <clears throat> in general. Um, I recently moved from Australia to Boston. I know Boston is very proud of its hospitals. Uh, but I'm surprised to see how many medical professionals walking around the city in their scrubs. How unsanitary is this? This is not a good idea. It's like if you're going, your street clothes are not medical clothes. <laughs> you know, so if we're, if we're depending on what the individual is doing in their specific environment, uh, the preferred would be that there would be a changing room of some type. And so if they're doing scrubs, which sort of suggests that they're sort of involved in a surgical type thing. And, doesn't necessarily have to be sterile, but you know, even on your shoes. And of course, you see on these medical shows when people go into the OR, they're you know, they're thoroughly covered, their their hair, their mouth, or you know, everything. They're 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 wearing gloves. They got booties on their feet, so you're not wearing the same type of thing. So, do I think it's it's a good idea? No, I don't. Uh, if they're basically just ushering people back and forth, and that's kind of their uniform, and they're not really devolved so much in direct one on one. Uh, with the patient, but the, you know, depending on what their particular role is in that medical clinic, um, you know, it's it's not it's not the end of the world. But for the people who have direct one-on-one -on -one contact, uh, then I think uh, we, we, you'd want to be a, a little more mindful of uh, street clothes and those uh, type of sensitivities. Uh, how do we help uh, electro hypersensitivity? And of course, we live in a society that. Um, there's you can't get away from it you know if you're looking at a computer like I am right now there's uh there's you know electro and radiation coming up um you know there are there are people so the electromagnetic exposure that we have in our society wi-fi cell phones computers i mean we live in a society and we our cars are now of gps we're constantly being bombarded by this stuff if you live near a cell tower, you're being more bombarded by this type of stuff. <clears throat> and we know that these electromagnetic, which are just part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is goes from x-rays and the visible light and ultrasounds and, uh, you know, all the other uh, you know, types of radio frequencies that are on the electromagnetic spectrum, have an effect on our cells. Our cells have a vibration associated with them. The, you know, what we're talking about has a specific vibration. And depending on what's going on individually for the person, uh, there is the aspect that that vibration may not be in sync with the with the patient. So they would need to protect them. And you can buy devices 
uh, to put on your cell phone. You can buy devices that you can put in your pocket uh, or wear around your neck, whatever. Uh, there's devices. In fact, I'm wearing one. You can't see it. It's under my tie. <laughs> Uh, per se, that basically has some degree of, of protection uh, because of the fact we do live in a society that uh, has has this type of exposures uh, over time. Now, when somebody has a specific uh, issue uh, with a with a specific, I'll say, a computer, and uh, right now I have a a, a young uh, uh, senior in high school who they do a lot of work on the computer and I mean, it's very draining for them. It gets causes them to get headaches and that type of thing. You say, well, what I, I have to work on the computer because that's pretty much what I do now. So uh, this will be a little bit curious, but I because I've had such good success with it, this is what I recommended to them is that we basically just take a regular old little tincture bottle that you can, you know, you can buy it at the store or, uh, you know, comes with the different types of, sometimes there'll be medicines in there, you can flush, wash it out. So then we basically put uh, spring or filtered water in there. <clears throat> and then we add a couple of drops of pure alcohol, which you can get, uh, you know, 100 proof alcohol, just a few drops. We put it, so we take the top off, it's full of spring water, put a few drops of alcohol as the preservatives. And then we basically, we just set this in front of the computer and leave it running uh, for 24 hours. And what, that, what the, this bottle does, it picks up that energy right through the glass of, of your, that's coming off the computer. <clears throat> and so what I have this young man doing is, of course, we have a dropper here. We can put this back in. And I said, every time you go to use the computer, we do this, which is called succussion, which basically is adding more energy into the liquid. And then I said, before you, when you sit down to use a computer, take five drops of that every time you do it. And every time you go to use it, it's going to cost it a little bit more. And that type of a treatment uh, has done really well. And whether you put it in front of your computer, whether you put it on beside your cell phone, <clears throat> you can do it for anything that if you're, if those types of things are a, a specific problem. Uh, thankfully, uh, many of us don't have that, although the electromagnetic component is having a component of that. So, you know, one of the places that is ideally at nighttime when you're sleeping, you have no Wi-Fi devices in your bedroom, but people have cell phones, people have iPads and they're, they're playing games or whatever they're doing. Get that stuff out of the bedroom. You don't want that stuff in the bedroom because especially if it's beside your head, you know, you're constantly being picked up because if the Wi-Fi is running and you have a cell phone sitting there, constantly picking that up. You're constantly being exposed to that stuff. Get it away from you as much as you possibly can. Try not to put the cell phone physically on your body. Women can put it in a purse, uh, you know, or you can use a carrier case is what I tend to use, but I tend not to wear it as, as I wear it as little as possible. And I leave it as far away from me as possible. And they're just simple type things that can have a, a positive benefit uh, for people uh, for, for what's going on. So I hope that, that answers that uh, that particular question. Uh, is it true that drinking lemon water first thing in the morning is recommended? Uh, without any doubt. However, I have pre preference over lemon water. My preference is actually apple cider vinegar, uh, unpasteurized with the mother uh, apple cider vinegar uh, in it. And what the whole idea of that is is what it's what we can train our body to do. People think of vinegar, it's acidic, it helps because our, our stomach is more acidic, it's, it's supposed to help digestion, etc. Well, that's, in theory, that's great. Lemon water, in theory, that's great. But more because, you know, lemon is a little, a little bit of tart, there's a little bit of acidity there. But nothing, nothing close to what the acidity in our stomach is, which ideally is between one and two. Uh, you know, you're talking, you know, lemon water that may be five, five and a half, even six, depending on how tart the lemon is. So it's not going to be like suddenly, oh, that's how I'm going to be able to digest my food. So the the more critical aspect of using uh, this, of using uh, apple cider vinegar or squeeze the lemon in water, is that you get in a you get in the process that you're literally telling your body that food is coming. Uh, in fact, if you do it consistently, what I've found with my patient population, if you do it consistently for about three months, and so what I have people do with apple cider vinegar in about four ounces of water, we add half a teaspoon, in some cases one teaspoon of water, 
and we drink that, ideally uh, 10 to 15 minutes before meals, before we even eat. And, and in addition to drinking it, what should be happening is you should have a mind thought saying, oh, I'm going to be eating soon. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to gear up my digestive process to be able to, to digest the food. So just like uh, those of you who live in the, the more northern climate than where I am here in sunny uh, uh, Arizona, so I know there was a big storm in the east and it's cold in the east. And so, you know, if you were to go outside, let, uh, let's say it's 15 or 20 degrees uh, and, and just want to drive your car away, it's like, eh, probably not a good idea. Let's turn the car on. Let's let it get warmed up a little bit. So what we're trying to do with lemon water, we're trying to do with apple cider vinegar is to warm up the digestive system because there's a whole process that goes with, you know, starting up in the brain that tells the, the stomach that things are coming, make more hydrochloric acid. It tells the bile to release bile salts. It tells the pancreas to start relieving lipase and amylase and cellulase. Uh, it tells the small intestine that, that food is coming and to have a motile contraction. So there's a hormone that gets released, the CCK. And what we can do with this process of apple cider vinegar or lemon water, if you do it regularly, and it takes about three months, then in all honesty, you don't even need to take it. All you need to do is think it, and the body will be trained to be able to do it. So I'm a huge fan of doing that. I'm a huge fan because we see so many people who have uh, digestive issues and digestive problems that that's a you know it's much better than having to take you know different types of aids or that kind of thing uh, to try and get your digestive system uh, working much more efficiently uh, over time. So I'm a fan of doing that. Uh, and, if, and and another thing with with uh, some people say, well, I don't like the taste of uh, apple cider vinegar. Well, you know, if you do the same thing, this is an apple cider vinegar bottle, but if you literally just do that and go and smell it say the same affirmation about what it is that you want to happen. You do that for a few months and guess what? This $4 bottle of apple cider vinegar will still be, still look full in three months from now and you will have done a huge benefit to your digestive system. And just another comment on digestion, especially being winter time and you know, the aspect of the, the people coming in here. I mean, I'm not a fan of, of uh, raw foods, not, take away from raw food diet people uh, per se, and mostly because the people that we see have rather significant digestive issues uh, or their lower, their body temperature is low. I mean, there's a reason that our body temperature is ideally 98.6 plus or minus 0.3, because that's the temperature at which our enzymes are the most effective uh, to basically be able to handle the food, whatever it is that we're eating, whether it's carbohydrate, protein, or fats and be able to break those things down. Uh, so this time of year, um, you know, when it's 115 here in Arizona, not quite as uh, urgent, but for those of you presently, so I definitely recommend people warm, steam, stir fry, grill, pressure cookers, broths, soups. So you eat a food that's warmed up. If you eat a food out of the refrigerator, let's say you have an apple or a piece of celery in the refrigerator, you take it out, you put almond butter on it and eat it, and especially if the almond butter was in the fridge too, you're basically eating a food at 40 degrees. Well, I can guarantee you, ain't no enzymes going to work at 40 degrees. So your body literally has to cook it. It has to warm it up to about 98 degrees to properly be able to digest it. That takes a lot of energy. And so if you're one of your challenges, I don't have enough energy, well, what then save some of your energy that you don't have to ask your digestive system to literally steal that energy just to digest food when all you need to do is warm the food up uh, in general. Uh, so that's a little a bit of a tip on that uh, aspect of things. Okay, next question. Uh, is an annual checkup really needed? <laughs> what an interesting question. Depends. <clears throat> so if the annual checkup is, uh, you know, your doctor goes in and how are you doing? I feel that, this, that, 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 love, that, 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 yeah, you're fine. Come back in a year, oh, I did your cholesterol, maybe it's a little high, blood sugar looks okay, uh, thyroid, your TSH is okay. It's like, uh, probably that's not very beneficial. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, I don't know how many years ago, but there was a study uh, commissioned a number of years ago where they did so-called screening or annual physicals on 25,000 people without really saying, asking them anything. 
And of the 25,000 people, uh, they, they only were able to find 63 of those people had anything that required some type of follow-up, which suggested that, wow, so what about all these other people? Say, well, they didn't have a specific complaint, so there was no reason to be more investigative, of, or they didn't ask him about a specific complaint. So the the true benefit of doing that is if, like, if you have a, if you have, if you're coughing, and you go to the doctor when they listen with their stethoscope, you're gonna hear something per se. But to just go in and say, Doc, how am I doing? And they do, you know, love dub and this Joe, your sounds fine. But we know so many people who basically had a stress test. In fact, was one of my patients um, probably three or four months ago. Or it wasn't my patient, it was, it was her father uh, who had this, had a stress test and unfortunately died of a massive heart attack the next day, but passed the stress test with flying colors. So it doesn't really give us, that's why, you know, the preferred, the way we do the functional testing in the office gives us a little more insight into maybe what's going to happen down the future as opposed to what's happening right now. So depending on your doctor and how investigative that they get, you know, does an annual checkup, for many people, it gives you a false sense of security. In fact, what was recommended after that study was done uh, by the American Medical Association was, should we even do these tests? Because we would be a lot better off telling people to spend more time with them. You should wear seat belts. Uh, you basically should, you know, eat healthier food. You should move your body every day. You should try and get regular sleep. Uh, you should use safe sex practices, et cetera. You should stop smoking, et cetera, et cetera. And they felt that if they did that, they would have saved the, they would save the medical system billions and billions of dollars. But patients said, oh, what happened to my annual physical? Nothing happens. Well, annual physicals, unfortunately, don't usually find very much. Uh, in other words, screening things. But if you come in and say, I've had a headache for three weeks, you'll find something, or my left arm hurts. Uh, so when there's a specific complaint and you do investigation, you find much more information. The routine screenings that are quite cursory, at least in this huge study that was done years ago, was not very helpful. So that may or may not answer your question about uh, annual physicals. I'm, I don't really find that you know, people get much information out of them other than a false sense of security. Oh, I can keep eating my ding-dongs or, uh, you know, having my diet seven up uh, every day. And I, my doctor said it was fine. It's not a problem. That may be give you, uh, unfortunately, a false sense of security uh, for what's going on. Right, we've got a few minutes. Let's say we have one more question. Uh, the use of essential oils is becoming popular, including internal use. I'm wondering if that is safe and how essential oils could be best used. Uh, essential oils have been around forever. In fact, uh, a few years ago, I was in Egypt and essential oils were used in the with the in the tombs by the pharaohs 5,000 years ago. So people have known a lot about the importance of aromas, the healing properties of essential oils for at least 5,000 years, at least the Egyptians, or maybe uh, earlier reports in history of that the essential oils have been used. They mostly have been used topically uh, on the skin for a variety of different types of, of ailments. Uh, however, there are some companies that now are, are manufacturing essential oils that are safe to be used internally for specific types of problems, whether that's uh, you know, uh, an anti antimicrobial uh, type of a remedy, an anti-parasitic uh, type of a remedy, uh, an autoimmune uh, type of a remedy, and uh, all that kind of thing uh, for, for what's going on. So are they safe? Uh, in my belief, they're safe, assuming the manufacturer who's making them, says right on the label, can be used for internal use. However, there are some essential oils that should not be used internally, which means they're used in... Um, and we'll say in a nebulizer or a little atomizer that basically puts this lavender or peppermint or chamomile or into the air. Uh, so you're breathing it in, uh, in, in sort of in a vapor form from that aspect of things. Uh, sometimes essential oils can be very irritating to the skin. Uh, so, you know, it comes down to a, an individual choice, uh, once again, for, uh, for what people are using it for. So, uh, you know, the brand that we have that I'm familiar with are safe for internal use and they are have very specific medicinal purposes. Uh, so generically, uh, the answer is yes, they are safe, but not all of them are safe. It comes down to the manufacturer and what it is uh, specifically you're using it for. So, and they are popular because, I mean, anything that's been around for over 5,000 years 
kind of means it's probably been time uh, true and tested and has been forever. Uh, and that's the kind of product. It would be lovely to say that, you know, medications have been around for 5,000 years, which of course we know they're not. In fact, we know that most medications go off the market in a relatively short time uh, because of the fact of so many adverse effects. <clears throat> it tells you that really, are they safe to be taken internally? <clears throat> okay, I think that was the last question. But a reminder that in uh, Saturday, February the 9th at 10 o'clock Eastern, which makes it uh, 8 o'clock here in Arizona, there's going to be another one of these webinars uh, by Dr. Jody uh, uh, <clears throat> Dashor, uh, speaking on autistic spectrum disorder, obviously a very important topic. Uh, you can sign up for that right now. Um, and you can also get a recording of this one, uh, which will be available at the brmi.online backslash webinars. So I hope you have found this to uh, be helpful, uh, answering some of your questions. And in fact, uh, give your feedback, uh, you know, uh, online, that type of thing. And if this type of thing is definitely, I mean, we're more than willing uh, to be able to continue to do this type of thing, to try and give you as much uh, information as you can, because Fortunately, a lot of times the stuff when you find it on the web, you know, Dr. Google may not have the most up-to-date or the most practical type things that, uh, you know, from somebody who has been sort of in the trenches, uh, you know, for, I've been in these trenches for a long time. So not that I have answers to everything, but at least I have experience. And as we see from uh, the variety of different types of questions that were asked today, uh, you know, we can hopefully offer a little bit of insight that uh, will hopefully get your mind thinking about things. So. <clears throat> We wish you uh, the best of the this particular time of year, season. Uh, be safe uh, and uh, happy health to everyone. And we'll talk to you again. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Bye for now.